And then I guess we'll start going here. And because it's going to be a recording, you know, we could, uh, if need be, you know, if, if you feel like you fumbled, you could start over. Steve might be able to cut it out, probably take him some time, though. So it'd be better if we didn't do that. But if is we, Steve going to edit this, man. Is Steve going I to don't. Edit? I, I'll, if, if you need him to, I'll ask him to. I didn't ask him to. So. OK. We shouldn't we shouldn't need it. I mean, if we stumble, we stumble. OK, <laughs> I agree. All right. Well, like Let me just a rampage organize. With all kind of balloons that need to be deleted. As we start standing up and waving our arms around like crazy. That's right. <laughs> Hi, um, welcome to our panel. This is Alliance Building and Root Cause Analysis Towards Fundamental Systemic Transformation. I'm going to be giving the first presentation. My name is Ann Peterman. I am the Executive Director of Global Justice Ecology Project. I'll be giving a bit of an overview of the issues that we're talking about. I will be followed by Larry Lohman from Corner House, who will be talking about um, the issue of ca carbon uh, carbon numbers and the difference between an analyzing carbon numbers and climate justice organizing. And uh, then Oren Langell from Global Justice Ecology Project will be showing some slides of the social uprising in Chile that happened just before the UN climate conference that was scheduled to occur there. Um, so I will start with a little bit of an overview. Catastrophic climate change is rooted in social injustice, ecological destruction, and economic domination. It is inextricably intertwined with the other global crises, including food, water, and biodiversity loss through a system that enables global elites to gamble with the earth, people's lives, and our collective futures in pursuit of power and profit. Successfully addressing the climate crisis will require broad and visionary alliances that unite to expose these root connections and challenge global elites through mass direct action targeted at fundamental systemic transformation and a future of global justice and ecological balance. Why the focus on systemic transformation? Why can't we just use new technologies to end the use of fossil fuels and switch to renewables and alternatives? Because fossil fuels, because stopping fossil fuels will not stop climate change. If business as usual continues, based not on fossil fuels, but on bioenergy, then we still lose. The US military, for example, is transitioning some of their fleet to biofuels and has investigated, investigated the manufacture of green bombs for using synthetic biology for their wars. A scientist friend of ours calculated that replacing the amount of fossil fuels we currently use with bioenergy, ethanol and biodiesel from crops or less electricity generated from burning wood, would require six planets worth of land. But bioenergy is not the only problem. In Chile, the Atacama people who live in the driest place on the planet, the Atacama Desert, are losing their precious fresh water to lithium mining, lithium to be used in the manufacture of single occupancy electric cars for the US and other wealthy countries. Elsewhere in Chile, copper mining is wreaking havoc on communities and ecosystems. Every single wind turbine constructed can use five or more tons of copper. Massive hydroelectric dams have been constructed on some of the most pristine lands on the planet, most home to indigenous communities. Even the Amazon rainforest has been targeted by dams. Both the turbines and the turbines in the hydroelectric dams and the rotting vegetation on the flooded lands release vast amounts of greenhouse gases. And the very construction of these concrete behemoths uses enormous amounts of energy. Often these ecologically and socially devastating projects are undertaken not to provide power to people, but to mines and smelters. Replacing fossil fuels with so-called alternative energies only rearranges the deck chairs. That iceberg called catastrophic climate change is still going to sink the boat. Nor can we offset them. There is no such thing as net zero emissions. Forest carbon offsets, for example, a major focus of many of the UN climate conventions going back nearly 20 years, neither protect forests nor reduce emissions. They allow continuation of business as usual. Under forest carbon offset schemes, including the International Red Program, 
reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Forests are priced according to the carbon they contain and credits can be earned by protecting, quote unquote, those forests. That means two things. Locally in places like uh, the locally in places like Richmond, California, where the Chevron refinery is based, offset emissions will continue to devastate surrounding communities and the gross level of emissions remains the same. It can also mean that indigenous and forest dependent communities are forcibly re relocated so that governments can take over their forests and sell their carbon stored as offsets. It also gives the biotechnology and timber industries new momentum to gain acceptance of genetically engineered trees, which have been roundly rejected by a broad global consensus for more than 20 years by using the roots of trees engineered to offset emissions by growing faster and never rotting. But beyond the social injustice of forest carbon offsets is the simple scientific fact that offsets literally mean a net result of standing in place. If today's living species are to survive, this will not suffice. What is required are drastic emissions, reduction of emissions at the source. Nor can these systems that are driven by these false solutions be simply reformed. They, we must organize to fundamentally confront and transform them. Even a generally conservative National Academy of Sciences here in the US has called for a quote, deep transformation based on a fundamental reorientation of human values, equity, behaviors, institutions, economies, and technologies in order to avoid crossing a planetary threshold. But we can't achieve this in the US by ourselves. This must be done in unity with allies globally. International solidarity is fundamental to solving the climate crisis. It is critical to defending the traditional knowledge and rights of, of indigenous and land-based communities around the world that have been living harmoniously and sustainably with the earth. This will help ensure that long-term solutions to climate change based in their traditional knowledge are protected. During the UN climate conference in Poznan, Poland in 2008, the then Climate Justice Now Alliance issued a statement told, called radical new agenda needed to achieve climate justice, which points out we will not be able to stop climate change if we don't change the neoliberal and corporate-based economies which stop us from achieving sustainable societies. Corporate globalization must be stopped. It went on to call for a focus on proven real solutions to climate change. It stated, indigenous peoples, peasant communities, fisher folk, and especially women in these communities, have been living harmoniously and sustainably with the earth for millennia. They are not only the most affected by climate change, but also by its false solutions, such as agrofuels, mega dams, genetic modification, tree plantations, and carbon offset schemes. Instead of market-led schemes, their sustainable practices should be seen as offering the real solutions to climate change. But to lift up and make room for these real solutions, we truly have to change the system, not what is fueling it. Business as usual has to go. Unfortunately, power concedes nothing without a demand. In fact, power concedes nothing without being given no other options. So how can we accomplish this change in the system? History teaches us that direct action movements, mass direct action movements, such as those we have recently seen in Chile that make business as usual impossible are the sources of real change. Movements not focused on numbers, but on ending neoliberalism, shutting down Wall Street, Amazon, and the other drivers of mass consumption among the rich countries and the world's elite. Movements that demand the repatriation of ancestral lands of indigenous peoples, which are rooted in the understanding that the forests and ecosystems on the planet that are the most intact are also those inhabited by the people who depend on them for their survival. That is what real transformation looks like. We'll have some more conversation after the three presentations, but that's an overall, an overarching view of what we wanted to talk about on this panel. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Larry Lohman, who's gonna give a presentation, getting into some of the more details about this. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Um, let me just set up my slides here. I put, just for fun, I put together some slides to accompany my talk today. So I hope it's, uh, I hope it helps sort of um, uh, in, in, uh, in provoking some discussion. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be sort of uh, going a little, bit, a little bit more into the kind of point that Anne was making about uh, you know, the fact that what we're talking about here is, 
you know, movement building and popular mobilization, action in the streets and elsewhere by, uh, you know, democratic movements. Uh, you know, we're not talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, technocratic solutions, which, which rely on counting carbon molecules. And that's going to be my particular focus today is just to try to try to get under the skin a little bit of, you know, why it is that even, you know, many of our friends in, in climate movements, uh, and especially in northern countries, uh, you know, continue to be identifying climate with carbon molecules and their movements and identifying climate action with engineering some way of changing the movements of those molecules. And, you know, as Anne, I think, was implying, this is not, not, uh, not uh, going to lead to any uh, constructive solution. Let me start with um, an old friend, probably almost a forgotten man by now, a guy called Rex Tillerson, chairman and CEO of Exxon Mobil and also, he served for uh, one brief year as uh, Trump's Secretary of State. And he said something very interesting in 2016. He said, yeah, there's climate change. Sure, I don't deny it. Clim but, but climate change is an engineering problem and it has an engineering, it has engineering solutions. Most climate justice activists rightly oppose themselves to Tillerson's understanding of climate change. But at a deeper level, is their understanding really much different? And is their approach any less implicated in injustice and any less threatening to effective climate movement building? This is the short provocation I would like to contribute to this uh, discussion. My main point is that most climate justice activists from the US and other Northern countries, just like Tillerson, see climate change in terms of greenhouse gas molecules like CO2 and climate action as effective prediction and engineering of the movements of those molecules. Of course, everybody knows that this molecule control notion of climate action guides all of the official approaches that we're familiar with. For example, the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, the 2015 Paris Agreement, and other carbon market plans, as well as various carbon tax schemes. All of these uh, approaches are focused on molecules, carbon dioxide molecules. And their distinction is that they try to attach a price to carbon dioxide molecules and call that a solution to the climate crisis. Of course, we also have geoengineering plans, uh, which again, are many are, are focused on carbon dioxide molecules, moving them out of the smokestacks into fantastic underground caverns or whatever. Uh, and we have our standard energy transition schemes, uh, you know, um, basically keeping the energy system the way it is, you know, with all of its, uh, the uh, problems of exploitation and extraction, some of which Anne was alluding to, but just uh, changing it so that the carbon molecules don't move around in the same ways that they did before. And this is called, this is called the climate solution. But in fact, exactly the same approach is also followed largely and thinkingly by most movements calling themselves climate justice movements. And this is the sort of provocation I want to throw out to, to uh, many movements that are calling themselves climate justice movements today. So we have this idea of you know, carbon action with justice, just transition schemes. Okay, fine, but what is this transition? It's all about carbon molecules, transitioning to a system in which carbon molecules are moving around a little differently from the way they are today. Green New Deals, all about carbon. Uh, the, main, the end focus of the Green New Deals is all about uh, reducing carbon emissions. Equitable climate finance plans. What are we financing? We're financing moving around carbon molecules in a different way. Greenhouse development rights, carbon. System change initiatives, many of them are also at the root about carbon. Because all these approaches continue to follow mainstream climatology by explaining or identifying climate change with CO2 molecule motions, their way of addressing it tends to be to find either managers or political movements capable of controlling those motions. So once you, once you start out with these assumptions, you're on a sort of a, a railway train of, of, of political solutions that take a particular direction and have a particular bias. 
And of course, this is a way, the whole justification for this is this is a way of getting the, this manipulation of carbon molecules is a way of getting the physical climate system described in general circulation models back in some kind of balance that might favor human survival i.e. climate change is still seen by most climate justice activists in climatological terms as an outside forcing to an otherwise coherent model of atmospheric dynamics. And climate action is seen as finding ways of forcing the system back into livability via system change or whatever. It's impossible in my view to overestimate how deeply this political logic remains rooted in Northern climate movements, even climate justice movements. Not only among those who align themselves against climate justice, and here's a famous example from Extinction Rebellion, a guy who says, we don't have time to argue about social justice because we have to solve climate first, as if climate is something separate from Black Lives Matter or uh, uh, LGBTQ rights or whatever. But also among those who identify themselves with climate justice movements, and Bill McKibben is a good example. I mean, he wholeheartedly identifies himself as a climate justice activist. But what does he talk about? He talks about carbon molecules. He talks about 350, 1.5 degrees or whatever. And his idea apparently is that, well, yeah, this is what climate is about. This is what solving climate change is about. But let's make it just. Let's tack on some justice at the end of this end of all these numbers and molecule movements. It's also impossible to overestimate how deeply this political logic is rooted in 20th century climatology itself, which, as mentioned above, is where northern climate justice movements get their definitions of climate and climate change from in the first place. Let me give a, a very clear example, I think. In 2014, Sir John Houghton, who was a founding member of the IPCC, the, the UN um, body of scientists, gave an interview explaining why IPC scientists could not mention the carbon in fossil fuels in their analysis of climate change, but only carbon that had become more mobile in the form of CO2. To follow what happens when carbon atoms move over the border into the atmosphere is science, Houghton said. But to analyze what happens to make so many carbon atoms migrate in this way is, and I quote, not a science question. In other words, fossil fuel extractivism can have nothing to do with the climate object as it's defined by climatology. Climate is about carbon. Climate has nothing to do with all of these other things. Industrial revolution, steam power, fossil fuel extraction, uh, plantation slavery, and air pollution, all the rest of it. Therefore, at the very deepest level, climate action must be about carbon, controlling these carbon movements when they're moving over the border into the atmosphere. And not about this, these sorts of things which uh, might be called political action or cultural action, but these are not seen as climate action proper. To try to understand better just how pernicious current climatology's definitions of climate and climate change are, let's recruit a little help from some friends. Let's return to that picture that climatology or contemporary climatology at least gives us of an organic, ideally predictable climate modeled inside computer programs. And looking at this picture, let's try to remember Zizek's point that society as a corporate body, an organically functioning whole with all the different classes, genders, et cetera, contributing to the whole according to their, to their function is always the fundamental ideological fantasy. For example, the Nazi fantasy of an organic, harmonious, Aryan society, which couldn't have worked without the fantasy figure of the alien Jew coming in and spoiling everything from outside and causing all the problems that are so evident or were so evident to everybody. So too, the fantasy of a computer modelable organic climate system is incomplete without, for example, the fantasy that what forces a normal atmospheric system is CO2 molecules coming in from outside it. The fantasy logic is always to organize reality so that the solution to contradictions and conflicts becomes the exclusion of a disruptive other. This other might be human or it might be other than human. 
in order to be powerful enough to explain away the ecological and political contradictions of capitalism, these others must always be endowed with a special magic, a mystical aura, superhuman charge, a je ne sais quoi, an indescribable oomph, an excess zip or surplus, a sinister Victoria's secret. Which is why we have to have equally magic or mystical beautiful walls built to keep the alien others out. These fantasies may be made out of concrete and steel, but they're still fantasies. Or beautiful magic impossible climate laws to exclude excess alien carbon from the atmosphere without changing anything else. These fantasies may be made from real institutions like the UNFCCC and real human actions, but they're still fantasies. Thus, your typical just Green New Deal has no problem with thermodynamic energy or with carbon extraction or any extraction as such. It's only when carbon threatens to become an immigrant into the atmosphere that it must be controlled and controlled or detained. Climate justice activists often have a hard time accepting that contemporary mainstream science and policy are loaded with fetishes and fantasy in this way. We can easily see the racism fantasies and anti-science blustering in a Tucker Carlson or a Jair Bolsonaro, but we rather carelessly assume that the antidote to their racist anti-science postures must be more peer-reviewed science and policy advice without realizing the structural similarities of the fetishes that permeate and partly constitute both. You can't undo the, these magic powers of the fantasy figures inside today's climatology of the irrational argument. For example, everybody knows already that CO2 molecule immigration law, i.e. Uh, the UNFCC's uh, uh, treaties, have only increased CO2 immigration and, and have neg negatively affected efforts to curb climate change through some of the mechanisms that, that Anne mentioned, for example, the RED program and carbon offsets and so forth. But this now everybody knows this, but this knowledge remains, so to speak, unacknowledged in favor of the fantasy. So I'd like to suggest that what, per, what are perhaps needed more are subject changing experiences that help traverse these fantasies inside climatology and carbon action, helping move things along toward better climate conceptions and stronger climate movements. For example, conversations with movements already engaging with non-carbon conceptions of climate through struggles over settler colonialism, mining, living labor, and the history of machines and empires. Conversations that do not start by condescendingly informing everybody present about uh, GCMs and carbon dioxide molecules and 1.5 degrees centigrade on the assumption that this is just what climate is. I'll stop it there. Great, thank you, Larry. That was a really excellent overview on exactly what the movements are not doing, but should be. Anyway, I appreciate that. Um, and Oren is gonna be talking about what the movements in Chile have been doing that are looking at targeting mm -hmm. neoliberalism, neoliberalism itself which was born in Chile under the Pinochet uh, dictatorship, which was also put into place by the Chicago boys from the United States. So um, anyway, I will let Oren get into his photographs from the Chilean uprising, which we, we were at, both he and I, in 2019. Go ahead, Oren. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Larry. Um, I will try to... Uh... Uh, just say a few brief words and then get into my presentation with the with the photographs I took down in in Chile. Uh, as Anne said, uh, neoliberalism began in uh, in Chile, ushered in by the United States, and um, but actually the CIA um, was very much involved in it. And there the movements things started, I guess, in October of 2019. That things flared up in Chile over a, a bus, um, I guess a, a subway, uh, public transformation transfer, uh, transportation um, hike in prices, and it just burgeoned out into this really huge uh, movement in Chile that affected everybody in Chile. There's no doubt about it, and 
it, it um, was a voice of many, many different people that came out. Well, anyway, Ann and I and uh, Gary Hughes from Biofuel Watch went down to Chile for the COP, what was it, COP19? Is that right, Ann? Honestly, I don't remember which number it was. <laughs> it was a cop, I, I, I think know, it was so 25, maybe. Yeah, there's something like that. I, yeah, I, that, that, the numbers mean, Might have been the a numbers mean nothing. Yeah, the, the numbers mean nothing there because it's that nothing much gets uh, accomplished if that people agree to come back again and discuss what's going on. So we went down to Chile. I actually was... Uh, um, um, certified to attend the UN meetings as press and accredited by KPFK radio in Los Angeles Pacifica. And I, we, before we went down, we heard that the meetings were going to be canceled in Chile and be moved to uh, Madrid. Well, anyway, a lot of the NGOs uh, that go to the kind of climate cops, uh, went to Madrid and they just kind of disregarded everything else that was going on in Chile. And, and as, as the, one of the sayings in uh, Chile is that this is where neoliberalism began and this is where neoliberalism will end. And neoliberalism, capitalism has been, you know, it, it's very destructive on the planet as we know. And if we're talking about system change, it would be I, I can't understand why people went to Chile and then went to Madrid instead of maybe joining the social movements down there and learning from the people and building alliances and becoming stronger and stronger. But I think a lot of people go to these meetings just to be seen and that's a big deal to a lot of the NGOs. And I don't really know how much even of an analysis they have of any kind of political awareness or anything else. So I'm going to show some uh, some slides. Hopefully, I will be able to do this. So let me. Okay. Okay. No, that's not working, is it? You are now screen sharing. Can you see? Okay. Am I shared on the screen? Yes. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna switch this to the. Uh, full screen and hopefully this is going to work okay well i th i guess but a lot of my talks about you know just the uh, i guess capitalism neoliberalism whatever but that uh, people in chile as i said they had a big uprising because of the uh uh, uh bus fares or subway fares and then it just turned into this big, huge thing where people now demanded to have a new constitution because the constitution in Chile was uh, still part of the Pinochet uh, regime. And so not much was really changing. People were, you know, uh, decided that this was the place to take a stand. There were, this, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were, you know, joining the demonstrations and different points. It was all over the Chile. Business was not as usual. And there were protests going on every day until COVID actually shut them down the next year in 2020. But people continued to organize and they organized through phones, through whatever, and did finally work on the constitutional assembly where the people decided what they wanted into a constitution. And they, they won politically by that. Of course, now the capitalists are trying to discredit all of that. And um, anyway, so this is what some of the, my scenes when I saw in Chile. And as I said, there a, was a big, um, very big, uh, every, uh, excuse me, very big demonstrations, manifestations against the state, against the police, against the institution, against uh, basically the government of Chile. And people were, would be fighting in the streets uh, at least once a week, especially in, uh, in uh, Santiago and also in Temuco. And uh, Chile is a very, very beautiful place. Um, I don't know, it's one of the, the most, uh, gorgeous places I've seen, and I really like the people. And I wanted to just give a real quick thing about social change. And 
we were there with a woman by the name of Alejandra Para, who lives in Tumuco, Chile. And she was sort of the person we, we were part of the team that we traveled with. And she was an activist, you know, all her life. And she was saying that she was losing all hope that everything that she's done in life would be worthless. And then all of a sudden, this all these demonstrations started happening. And so it made her feel really good because she was somebody that stuck with and motivated to keep to, to make sure there was change happening. So this is right there. That's in Mapuche territory. Um, and the Mapuche are the indigenous peoples that live in basically in the region of, uh, I guess, you know, in Chile. I don't know if there, there's other indigenous people too, but um, I'll focus on the Mapuche. And when we went to one of the communities, the elder pointed at that uh, uh, volcano and said that it's been Mapuche land ever since the uh, ever since the beginning that that people can remember and it always will be Mapuche land, no matter who says owns it. And anyway, um, the Mapuche communities were very much involved in the uprising, although they were not asking for the same things. They, you know, it was sort of like an allied type thing going on at the same time. Then they started taking uh, control of, uh, you know, they actually had, re they called them reoccupations. And we went to a few of the reoccupations and really got a feel for what the, was going on in Chile. One of the uh, towns we went to, or villages we went to, uh, was an uh, this was an offshoot of um, their normal village that they live in, and they started reoccupying the land. And we were invited to come in and take photographs and to do filming. And they talked about you know their lives as Mapuche. And this photo in particular uh, is quite interesting because we were allowed to to uh, photograph a ceremony. And in my uh, I don't know how many years of photography and how many decades, but uh, I went to a lot of indigenous places and uh, usually we never film in any kind of a ceremony. And then we were actually asked to, to film this. And here's one of the community members here, the, the Mapuche say that everything is up to the young. And they, they try to educate the young people as the young, uh, uh, young people know that they have a place in Puche society and everything that they're doing now is for the is for the young people and for the land for the uh, to make things a little bit more healthy. And we went to a couple of different communities and the next day we were going shooting some um, other b-roll footage or something for some of the documentary we were doing and we went to uh, the national park in the area of Tamuco. And what, what's the name of the park? And do you remember? It, the Congiyo National Park. Thank you. I could not have said that. So uh, thank you for that. So we got a phone call that the uh, Cabanero, Cabaneros, which are the national police, who are very disliked in Chile because they're very brutal, um, attacked the village, the reoccupation village. And to make a long story short, here's some people. We did a lot of really interesting things to get to the community because the police had everything blocked off. But we did manage to get to the community who invited us in and uh, we stayed with the community. And earlier the mor that morning, uh, this man and uh, I, I believe you know uh, many others, not many, but maybe 13, something like that. I don't have the numbers in front of me, were shot by the, by the military, uh, by the national police. And this guy was shot in the head and then he came back and rejoined the blockade. Well, it was very, very interesting. Um, that was on, on Thanksgiving day in the United States in, uh, in 2019. And really no, no coverage. We were trying to get people to cover all of this because it was so interesting. And here's a, uh, just a stream uh, in, in Chile that is gonna be, uh, I believe, dammed. And, uh, and then people are trying to stop uh, all the hydroelectric and other project, projects when it comes to water, because even in Chile, water is life. And this man, Alberto Quiramil, uh, was a Goldman Prize winner, and I forgot what year, but a couple of years ago, and 
he um, stopped many different projects and then he was trumped up with some charges, found guilty and thrown into prison. We were fortunate enough to be able to, to take part a little bit in the trial and later- Not, not found guilty, Mills. he was just held, oh, real quickly, Warren, he wasn't found guilty, he was just held for, for a year and a half without being Correct. tried. He was ultimately found not guilty. Right. Thank you, Ann. I, actually, I, I've asked Ann to jump in um, if, if I leave out or make some uh, errors here. Uh, we went back after being in the Mapuche territory to the uh, back, back to Santiago. And right here is a, in the square where everybody goes to on a Friday night. And the reason why they have these eyes is because there's been over 400 people have been shot uh, by shotguns with rubber uh, metal, rubber coated metal pellets, and some were blinded, some very, very serious eye injuries, and that became part of the demonstrations of people uh, demanding justice for that. Uh, as I said, there were a lot of things going on in the streets. Here's a uh, tear gas flying over. Um, oops, I got a little too far ahead of me there. And the uh, women's movements were very much involved in the uh, in the uh, in the uprising, and uh, there were some women that called themselves the Red Masks and the Red Mask Movement. Uh, they did some wonderful things. Here was an International Women's not was an International Women's Day. Uh, it was a, a Women's Day of, of some some sort. And anyway, women all over the place were protesting and. Uh, did a lot of guerrilla theater. Also, I wanted to show this side in because it's very, you see the people on, on the foreground and in the background, you see the police and you see the, the military vehicle and everything is splattered with paint, including the police. And uh, you see a little bit of a fire down there that was from a, a Molotov. This man was sprayed in the face with, uh, with, with tear gas or some sort of a compound and he was getting uh, attention from street medics, and so was the person next to him. And uh, there were a lot, a lot of that was going on. We actually we had to wear goggles in the street. We had masks, and it was kind of uh, interesting to do. And as they, we have to admit, I have to admit, the people in the streets were very concerned about us being and taking these photographs, and they were very protective of us, and just really, really, uh, really nice. Uh, so here is a Friday night uh, in Santiago as uh, the riots are about ready to begin. Uh, and these people are digging up the dig, digging up the bricks in the street. I guess they're going to build something, I don't know, or they're going to throw that. But having said all of that, it, 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 people want justice. People are, you know, they're tired of uh, living under neoliberalism. And they're right now they do have a, uh, they're working on the constitution. They have a constitutional assembly has, has been writing it. They're trying to keep out all the uh, politicians. And so far it's one politically to be carried out. And we'll just see because of the neoliberalism is very powerful. And if that goes in Chile, you know, it might give people ideas that it could happen elsewhere. So I just was so happy that, you know, I was with people who uh, wanted to stay in Chile and document the resistance uh, and, you know, make different ties there. And I really, I was very shocked to see so many people go to Madrid. I had credentials to get into the convention there and I, I did not, did not use them. Um, I guess I'll stop it at that. And if I say anything about the, you know, NGOs, I'm not criticizing indigenous peoples for going to any kind of a UN conference because they, they, uh, uh, it's, it's very hard for them to get information. And uh, that's a, an interesting way to do it, to go to these things. But the NGOs, I would expect that should be a little bit more radical, be a little bit more uh, together, like in Copenhagen, we, you know, we, some of us uh, were there, we did organize protests, there was a protest outside, a protest inside, and the people were supposed to meet in the middle for a people's summit or a people's assembly. 
and that was broken up by the police. And it seems to me like ever since then, uh, you know, a lot of MGOs have really lost their uh, desire to become part of that, that, this because a lot of NGOs got kicked out. And I don't know if I just really feel that, you know, it would be great if the climate justice movement could align itself more with some of the social movements and some of the people and understand coming from, you know, just an economic viewpoint of what's happening and why the planet is being destroyed. If neoliberalism is being uh, causing so much of, you know, the planet destruction, why go to a climate cop to talk about when they're going to meet again? And why not stay with the people and let's start building movements? And that's about it. I thank you all for my uh, for the time and I will be quiet. I think we're all going to talk and rave about things now. Is that correct? Sure, yeah, I'm not sure how much time we have left on the, the formal hour, um, as I didn't pay attention to when we actually started this. Um, but yeah, we wanted to have some time for conversation. And I know that as this conference goes on, there will also be opportunities for people to pose questions to us via the internet, I guess, um, this being recorded on the 20th of September, and I don't believe it's gonna be aired until October sometime. So uh, I hope people will take that opportunity to, uh, have some back and forth with us about some of these things that we're putting out there. Um, I will also mention that Oren has all of these photographs on the Global Justice Ecology Project website. If you go there and you look for Chile, you can find photo essays and videos from our work in Chile. Um, but I want to uh, open it up for conversation. Um, you know, I think we all had different points, but interweaving into one sort of overarching idea that traditional climate activism as we're seeing it, um, especially in the buildup toward COP26, is not getting at the root of the problem, which was the, uh, the title of this, getting at the root of the problem and building alliances for real transformation, not mere, as Larry was saying, changing the system to a slightly less carbon-y system, but uh, really uh, making fundamental transformations in the economic, social, and political systems. So um, anyway, I'll just leave it at that and uh, open it up. And you're just, yeah, Larry. just kind of Larry. One, one thing that occurred to me while, while Oren was talking, I mean, and maybe this will, this will help weave together some of our presentations. I mean, I, when, when Oren was showing, showing the pictures of the uprising and and you know what what started the uprising and how this was linked to different issues, including you know the constitution, the police, neoliberalism, you know the the works. Um, I, I was just imagining Oren giving this presentation among you know uh, uh, maybe your average climate justice activists uh, in 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 a northern country like in Europe or in, in North America. And I can imagine the reaction of of some people, which would be very sympathetic, you know, this is, these are wonderful photographs, you know, this is a very important story, Oren, you're telling, you know, this is really crucial to talk about, but it's not about climate. Because it's not about, it's not about, you know, how do we control carbon molecules and get down to 1.5 degrees or whatever. Uh, so it's all very interesting and very important and we should take it into consideration and we should build, we should invite these people to be part of our carbon movement because it's very important, you know, to build this kind of people power and democratic action and stuff, but it's not about climate. And uh, this connects to the question which I was trying to raise, which is in a way a sort of, I don't know, social psychological question is, why do people think that this is not about climate? Why do even climate justice activists, why would their, some of their reactions, as I believe they would be, why would some of their reactions be that, well, this is all, you know, very important and very interesting, but it's not about climate. And I think we need to, we need to really, you know, step back and examine some of our unconscious uh, assumptions about what, what climate is, which come not only from climatology, which is, you know, has its own history in, you know, post-World War II cybernetics and all sorts of other basically right-wing um, technocratic visions, but, uh, you know, it has a much deeper, you know, it's much, much deeper and longer historical 
origins behind the common sense that would tell so many of us that this is not about climate. And I think we should question that. And I, I mean, and what, like one of my suggestions was we can question that by, you know, trying to have different experiences like, like Oren and Anne had in Chile, uh, which was based on their intuition that, you know, well, if we want to build climate movements, let's stay here in Chile and not, not zip off to, to Madrid where we won't be connected with what's actually happening, uh, you know, in terms of practical politics. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a very, you know, the, the, the psychological question, I think, is very deep, but I think it's one that we have to face when we join together with other fellow, you know, so-called climate justice activists, because I think, you know, we're not, climate justice is not a unified movement, and part of the reason it's not unified is because, you uh, is because of this instinctive but deeply rooted reaction that people, many people will have that this is not about climate. And to have those other kinds of experiences, I mean, you, uh, you know, you just have to get out, you have to get out more. I mean, I, I, I've had so many conversations with, you know, people in, in, in like uh, rural Indonesia or, or, uh, or even like Northern Scotland, where, you know, when you start a discussion about climate, it's never about carbon. It never starts with carbon. If you actually, if you actually, you know, start with start a, an open discussion about what's going on with climate, it's never about carbon. And it, it, if carbon is introduced, it's usually by somebody from the, the the global north who wants to explain, you know, all about the atmospheric concentrations and the fossil fuels and the, and and how we must all join together to lower the lower the carbon levels in the atmosphere and all of that. Um, but that's not where the that's not where the, the discussion starts, and that's also not where people in these places want the discussion to go. That's not the end of the discussion. It's not the beginning of the discussion. The the, the discussion might be about a lot of things. For example, it might be about you know well why you know why are we in this situation where we we can't we can't rely on the monsoon anymore, or you know we don't know what's going to happen with our with our crops anymore, and what's you know what's going what causes this? And the, and that question is never answered by oh well you know carbon dioxide concentrations are just too high and we must engineer them down to no. That's never where the discussion either starts or whether whether it or where it ends up. So I, I think that you know it's a really there's a deep there's a deep problem here in movement building, which I think really needs 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 more thought. Yeah, I, I'm very, thank you, Larry. I feel that the uh, that here we are in the, the time of you know a, a, we're in a crisis situation. I I really. I, I do think that I've thought that for a long time and worked on these issues for quite a long time uh, also. And we're in such a, in such a tremendous um, disadvantage, I guess, right now, because we have no government is not going to do anything that's going to be anything worthwhile, in my opinion. As Larry said about the Green New Deals and all of that doesn't really mean that much. Uh, it's because it's not, it really, it's just it's keeping the status quo uh, more than ever. But I don't know why, why the, some of the movements out there are not more radical, why, why they don't really want, want to, to be pushing for greater change, and especially in a time of crisis. Um, it, it just feel, it feels to me, it, it's a, it almost becomes like a hopeless situation. And I can't lose hope. I'm not. I'm not a hopeful person, though. But I can't lose it. Um, and I would really hope that people do get together and talk amongst each other. One of the first things that uh, I learned about the Zapatistas. I spent time in Zapatista territory in Mexico, in Chiapas, and one of their big messages was open up space for dialogue. And that's, I think, what a lot of us have tried to do is open up space for dialogue. Because if we don't talk to people and get face to face and really start organizing uh, and have spaces where people can come and feel welcome, then I believe that, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen if people don't do that because it seems like we're just headed right off the cliff. And I'm hoping that, because I know a lot of the climate movements say, yeah, say yes, yes, we're very, uh, we're very open. We, you know, anybody could come and stuff like that. But it's everybody sort of the same. You know, they're not, 
they're already the converted that they are talking to and they're converted in their own ways whether it's the way that you know the, the way that larry was talking about um and they they're just not they don't accept people from the outside i've i've found this out that most people it's like in the united states oh well you really for trump or for biden if you were for trump you're an asshole if you're for biden you know you have to be for biden and that's what all the liberal people were saying to me and i mean you know biden is part of the system he's part of the, the whole problem um and i mean so is trump but i you know biden's already uh, killed people in drone strikes that, you know, the wrong, he, they hit the wrong target. And now he's shipping off people from, um, from Mexican U.S. border and flying them back to Haiti. Uh, there's like 14,000, I believe, Haitians that are there. Uh, and they're, they're just stuck with nowhere to go except the Mexico-U.S. border. And to solve the problem, the you know, United States is sending in rangers, I mean, not rangers, but whatever police force, water patrol, to round these people up, throw them into uh, an airplane, and send them to uh, back to Haiti. And Haiti is, one of the reasons they left Haiti was because a long time ago, it was so tremendous with, the, with uh, environmental destruction and uh, political uh, treacherous political goings on that um, a lot of people left. They went to Chile, they migrated north when they couldn't make money. And now the, the way to solve the problem, says Biden, is just take them back to Haiti. Haiti does not want them because they're just going through a, a, a horrendous uh, hurricane and a, a political assassination. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what the answer is there, but Oh, I just wish people would have a deeper analysis of things to think about things and not go, oh, yeah, there's a Trump and there's a Biden. And then there's people that are just apathetic. But still, um, I, I think the, the, the doors are so shut between, OK, you can't talk to these people because they were for Trump. You can't talk to these people for the, they're for Biden. I don't know how we'll ever get any change if we don't talk to each other and talk to each other as people instead of uh, uh, you, you know, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm right. So I think I'll let it go at that. Thanks, Oren. And yeah, I think, uh, Larry, you were on something when you said, you know, uh, when you asked the question, why would a climate justice activist not understand or want to be involved in something like the Chile uprising if they had the opportunity? Uh, why would they go to Madrid instead? Or, you know, why would they let's say, understand more why people would go to Madrid to these climate meetings. And we went to the climate cops uh, as Global Justice Ecology Project for, I don't remember, 2004 to 2011, when we finally just quit and said, all right, that's enough. And uh, you can get sucked in, you know, you can feel like you have some power there. You can feel like, oh, I, I can make a difference. I can lobby our representatives or I can lobby the parties or I can blah, 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 whatever. Um, I'm in the halls of power, you know, and also I think it's a simultaneously it's a lack of belief in our own power as movements to actually achieve real change um, that we have to have the leaders do this for us that, you know, we'll never get anywhere just ourselves doing this. And as Warren said, we, everybody's so divided, especially in the United States right now that that's hopeless. So we just have to have our leaders do this for us. And that's a really unfortunate uh, way to think, because I think we've it's been clear, as you pointed out, Larry, since the beginning of the history of talking about climate change. Here we are, and you know we have a, the so-called Paris Agreement that is supposed to maybe do something one day with a bunch of voluntary commitments by companies that say, "Yeah, we'll get on board the net zero and offset and blah blah blah." Anyway, it's a very difficult. Um, situation I think that we're we're in with all of that. But when we were in Chile and we were there for about a month, being a part of these manifestations in the streets with, you know, tens of thousands of people, you know, almost every day and especially on Fridays. And that experience, I mean, I've been in the movement since 1989, you know, over 30 years, but being a part of uh, that kind of energy for that length of time of people really 
looking for this fundamental systemic transformation, you know, not just band-aids, but let's get rid of neoliberalism. As Oren said, their, their motto is, this is where neoliberalism was born and this is where it will die. And people being very serious about that. That was an amazing feeling. I mean, compared to the experience of going to the climate cops where you leave and you're just like, oh my God, you know, banged my head on another wall and got absolutely nowhere. Um, it was it was amazing, and, and that people missed that experience of being in the streets and being part of part of that power. Not everybody did. There were some folks who stayed, some other folks besides us, um, who got that, who got to experience that. And I feel like that was a real missed opportunity for the climate movement. People who, if they had stayed in Chile, if they had been part of that movement, if they had been able to learn from it, see it firsthand, experience it, might have because it is all encompassing. It's all these different issues packed into one um, one mass revolutionary movement, I think people could have maybe gotten an idea of what an effective climate, climate movement could look like and how it intersects with all the other movements in a really powerful way. Jack. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I think um, you know you you hit 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 it on the head when you said uh, you know this was if you if you were in Chile and you didn't take advantage of that, you really it really was a missed opportunity for you as a climate activist. Um, and to me, this is you know this is really important. It's a missed intellectual opportunity. It's a missed opportunity to define what we're all about. It's a missed opportunity to you know to grow together and to be challenged and to you know see a little deeper into things than you would ever see by you know uh, attending another uh, another cop i mean not that there's not a role for attending cops as you pointed out but uh you know if you want to if you want to build movements and you want to uh you know uh, redefine movements then there's no substitute for for getting out more uh, and getting out into the streets of chile in in, in this case I mean, I, you know, it's a familiar, it's a familiar kind of story from France and elsewhere. But I remember, you know, just before the, uh, just before the Chile uprising, I was in in Cuenca in, in Ecuador, where where the actual, the first of these sort of Latin American uprisings um, took place, which was quickly followed by Chile and 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 several other several other uprisings. And I remember the uh, you know the immediate the, the immediate sort of pretext for the for the um, for the uprising the sort of immediate organizing principle um, was outrage at at uh, uh, a um, a cutoff of fuel subsidies for ordinary people in terms of their you know daily transport to get to work or to get to their relatives or or whatever which, which had an effect on you know the how much it costs you to to go places um and you know this was this was uh you know this was due to neoliberal policy you know the idea that you know, you know we that these things are called subsidies and the subsidies to the oil companies are not subsidies so let's stop the subsidies for the ordinary people to get on the bus and let's uh, keep the subsidies for the oil you know the familiar sort of uh, neoliberal um neoliberal thing and and that was the immediate immediate cause of the uh, uprising, but you know, you didn't have to. You didn't have to sort of be there long or to talk to many people before you realized that this was just a, this was just you know one one thin edge of of a whole mass of interconnected issues, which included climate change, which included you know the extractivism that is related to climate change, which included the anti mining, which included you know the water is life movement in ecuador which included you know uh you know a whole history of um, indigenous and student uprising which goes back you know all you know 100 100 years uh, or more and particularly you know in, in ecuador's case it particularly goes back to you know the empowerment of the indigenous movement in recent in recent decades which is in, which is connected with so many different issues not only the ones i've mentioned but issues like uh, you know bilingual education uh, the, the the education the way we want it for our children in the indigenous areas uh, you know the uh, the you know a, a halt to these resettlement policies and these you know uh, 
these policies, which are attempting to assimilate people into the into the neoliberal uh, economy, and so forth. All of these things were connected in people's minds. You know, the, the journalist might say, "Oh, well, it's all about people who don't want to spend too much on their their transport fares and stuff." But it's, it wasn't it wasn't about that at all. And and the indigenous movement, since its renaissance, uh, especially, is you know was prepared and uh, uh, ready, ready to rise up against this. And they knew they had the power to rise up against this. And, you know, they, they, uh, they, defeated, the, they defeated the policy and they also uh, 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 inserted a wedge which, uh, which uh, uh, allowed them to have more, more uh, pressure and more power on, on a range of other issues. But I was thinking, you know, if, if, you, if you talk to a lot of climate activists uh, who don't, you know, who aren't open to talking about climate and other things with people like the people who were rising up in Chile and Ecuador. Uh, you know, the first, the first reaction, the thing that thing you start with as a climate activist, oh, well, gosh, these people, you know, they're in favor of fossil fuels because they want to keep going around on the bus and they want to keep going around and, you know, using, uh, using a cheap fuel that the government subsidizes so they can con continue to go to work on the bus and the subway air with, you know, and, and the first, because as a climate activist, you come from this idea that climate is about carbon. That's your first reaction. Your first reaction is, oh, well, gee, we're sort of opposed to these people, aren't they? Because, you know, it's like France, you know, the, the yellow jackets, they were, you know, they, they, they were, they, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't against carbon. It was, uh, you know, uh, these other things. So how are we, how are we going to work it out with these, you know, and this, this, is, this is what you call a learning opportunity. You know, this is an opportunity, this is an opportunity for some kind of intellectual change and process where you actually begin to question what your own idea of climate is and where that came from and why there's something problematic about your idea of climate as carbon. If you find yourself even, you know, for a moment thinking that you're opposed to the movement in Ecuador uh, about the, uh, the lifting of subsidies for fuel prices or the movement in Chile about the subway fares or whatever. Thanks, Larry. I, 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 I agree. I, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. And I think with that, I'm going to be quiet. But uh, uh, I was just real quickly, I wanted to throw things in. Uh, we were very involved in the anti carpet globalization movement. And um, I mean, I remember the media saying, oh, you have such a laundry list of uh, what you don't like. And they, you know, kind of would be very uh, nasty to some journalists about saying that people they just want everything and blah blah blah. Yeah, so we have, we do have laundry lists. These things are messed up, and you know it's like what are, what are we going to do? We have one thing that's messed up. Sure, it's reality the way it is right now. It's messed up, and we're living in you know in, in the life out of balance right now. There's no doubt about it. And uh, unless unless we you know do some things and look toward the, the past for some of the movements that were before before all of us and the struggle that they had. And if they didn't have uh, some of the struggle that they did and people died, uh, we wouldn't be here right now, I don't think. We'd probably all be in chains or something. But there's always been movements that, that were looking for change. And as Anne said, power can seize nothing without a struggle. But we don't seem to want to really get in and struggle too much anymore because it's too easy not to struggle. And you can pat yourself on the back and say, hey, yeah, look what I'm doing, you know? And I go to these climate cops, um, you know, I get to fly there and we get to go big parties and, uh, and oh yeah, I wanted to talk about the, the things. One person I wanted to mention, I won't say who it is, but he was an executive director of an organization that was more, well, I mean, mainstream, but still they were lead, leading to be, you know, pretty, pretty radical in some ways, but they didn't agree with global justice ecology projects, um, analysis and philosophy, and some of the tactics and strategy we use. Uh, and asked, he, this man stayed in Chile and he, after it was over, he came up to me and said, you know, I, believe that 
you're right about all the stuff you're saying. He said, it just took me a few whips of tear gas in the protest to understand what was going on. And I thought, now, if we can have, if that can, tear gas can have an effect like that on, a, on somebody that's ahead of an NGO, then uh, that's quite, it's quite a thing. And people need to open up their eyes. That's why you have to wear goggles in Chile because you get sprayed with tear gas. But. Yeah, we had tear gas in Cuenca as well. Yeah, you get to miss it after a while. You know, after a few weeks of getting tear gas every day, it's like, gee, I missed getting tear gas. Let's go get some tear gas. Anyway, Not me. just kidding about that. <laughs> just kidding about that. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, um, I don't know. I think we're probably at close to an hour. I don't know if uh, folks have any final remarks before we close the uh, this little session, but I think we could probably move in that direction. Orange, did you have any last thoughts besides the ones you just shared? No, it's, uh, just to say it was really great uh, being on a panel with both of you. And uh, it was good to see Larry again. It's been a while. And I hope people at the conference that uh, see this um, think, that, think out of the box sometimes. And um, it, it's, it's good to do that. Yeah, it's great to see you Absolutely. guys. Absolutely. Maybe and maybe you could maybe you could I don't know if you want to wrap up or you want to add add some final thoughts. You're the one who sort of began and introduced this thing. Maybe uh, maybe it'd be appropriate for you to for you to close it. Sure. Um, well, <laughs> thanks thanks for putting me on the spot there, Larry. No, uh, yeah, it's it's. I think we've all you know all of these presentations what they have in common is a belief that we can do better as the, as the so-called climate justice movement, um, for those of us who adhere to that or believe we're a part of it, that it isn't just, as Larry is pointing out, it isn't just about carbon, it isn't just about levels of carbon in the atmosphere, it isn't just about transforming the energies we use from one that's dug out of the ground to another that's constructed on the ground from things dug out of the ground. Um, it's it's more than that. It's a it's a it's a whole movement, and I think that's what we learned in Chile. It's a whole movement. It's about uh, people's struggles all over the world, indigenous struggles, struggles to remain on the land, struggles to um, you know give people their rights, fundamental basic human rights that are denied all kinds of people all over the world all the time such as the people being forced to go back to Chile, which is in you know a country in turmoil and ruin right now. Um, did I say Maybe Chile? Haiti. Sorry, Haiti. Haiti. Yeah, sorry, Haiti. Um, anyway, all of these issues intertwine and they're intertwined at the roots, the root causes of these social injustices, these ecological destructions, these forcing people off the land. Uh, you know, these are all the same root causes, you know, this, this globalized capitalism, this idea that uh, some people, the power elite, let's call them, are, are perfectly allowed, are entitled to control the lives and the planet of everybody, you know, the planet and the lives of everybody else. Um, and some of us simply don't believe that and don't believe that these same leaders uh, or these leaders who are controlled by these power elites are going to change the system or change this problem for us. And so we believe that we really have to go to these roots and figure out a much more, uh, revolutionary, if you want to say it that way, way of coming up with solutions that actually will move us forward on this global, uh, this global crisis. And uh, one that is going to ultimately affect every, every one of us and all of the other species on this planet. If we don't get together and figure out something more fundamental in how we address this problem. I guess I would leave it at that. So I'm glad that the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara is hosting this event, that it gave us the space to speak about these things and a lot of other people. And I hope it inspires folks to get more plugged in in a deeper way. Thanks. Oh, can I add one more thing real quick? Uh, yes. I want to say that my, my uh, connection to Santa Barbara, that's, the, that's where this is, right? Correct? Santa Barbara? The, yeah, 
my connection there was a long time ago when I was 18 years old, uh, hitchhiking around the, the United States because it was a thing to do and see things and meet people and learn. And I slept on um, a, an abandoned gas station on the outskirts of Santa Barbara for one night. So that's my experience with Santa Barbara. It was a nice, it was, the gas station was closed. So um, what year was that? Or? I don't want to, uh, 1969. That tells you a little bit about my age. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, Larry, so much. And thank you, Oren. And I'm really happy we did this. I think that was a lot of fun. And uh, people, people can check out more uh, at um, globaljusticeecology.org. And Larry, where would you direct people if they want more about what you were talking about? Uh, yeah, we have a website. It's it's called the corner house, all one word, uh, dot uh, uh, org dot uk. Great. And uh, said, again, there's going to be a Q&A opportunity somehow through this conference. So if you want to follow up with any of us, please feel free. Thank you.